If you have Bibles and would like to uh, have a look at this, it's Judges chapter 15. Judges 15. I thought this sermon title make, might make a few people laugh. Canadian society, when we talk about people drinking, it's usually about drinking alcohol, which would have the opposite effect to what is written about in this chapter, Judges chapter 15, which is about Samson drinking what God provided for him. It's about Samson getting to the end of his own resources and accepting what the Lord has on offer for him. And of course, that's going to prove to be enough for him on that occasion. All right, let's have a look at this. Later on at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Now, if you weren't here last week, um, for Judges chapter 14. In Judges chapter 14, Samson got married. He had a wedding anyway, and, uh, but it went disastrously wrong. And uh, he went home without a wife and his wife was given away to uh, the best man. But this is later on now, his hormones are bubbling to the surface and he's thinking, well, I actually have a wife. So he goes down there to visit her. Well, here's what happens. At least he took a, a, a gift, a young goat. That's a that's a pretty valuable gift in those days. I don't know if you'd be interested in it for, you know, Mother's Day or something. Anyway, Samson said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. So the father is a little bit afraid of Samson, and rightly so, because he's a pretty intimidating guy. So he's trying to make a compromise here. Samson's not buying it, though. Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes, as you would, of course, <laughs> and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He fastened a torch to each pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death, Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etam. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The people of Judah asked, why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. So then a party of the men of Judah go to arrest Samson. And of course, if you're going to go and arrest Samson, you take 2,999 friends with you. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him, shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, With a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramath Lehi, Jawbone Hill. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst 
and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place, and Lehi and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called En Hakore, Collar's Spring, and it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Verse 19, when Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. Samson was experiencing depression at that point in his life. And that's not a very happy topic, but something we need to address because it's right here in the story. We're wading through the story of Samson and in this chapter, Samson is depressed. There's a powerful poem by Edgar Allan Poe called Alone. It's about depression and that word describes it, alone. It says this, From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone. And all I loved, I loved alone. Then, in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life, was drawn from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still. From the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form, when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. The mystery that binds me still, a demon in my view. That's depression. And that's not very nice. When we're feeling depressed, all the joy of life can be sucked right out of us. We just read a few minutes ago, Joan led us in some verses from Isaiah that tells us that he's a God who wants to look after us. He's a God who delights in coming to the rescue. He's the God who gives us life. And we know that. We know these things. But in our worst moments, these truths about God that we accept and we, that we can cling to, that give us hope and enable us to get through the day, the muck and mire of everyday life, sometimes in our worst days, even those truths don't help us very much. We find little comfort some days. At the end of Judges 15, Samson is experiencing some serious spiritual depression. I don't know if he's clinically depressed. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what he's going through, but I know that he's at least what we used to call down in the dumps. He's not feeling very good. He's got his life's mission off to a great start. He's harming Philistines. That's what he was born for. That's what God has asked him to do, and now he's doing it. He's getting his mission accomplished. He's amazingly successful at it, and he's won the respect of his people, and they want to commit to following his leadership. And they're going to do that for the next 20 years. He's a pretty big success. He's finally made it. And he's depressed. Depression doesn't always uh, have a reason or an explanation, does it? And when you're suffering from depression, it's not very nice. There's been some famous people like Robin Williams have taken their own life because of this disease. So we're a lot more familiar with it than we used to be. Uh, as a society, we seem to have turned a corner. We're willing to talk about depression. We're willing to talk about mental health issues in a way that didn't used to happen. And Christians certainly should be aware of these things and should be talking about these things and trying to understand them from a biblical point of view. Cam H, Canada's Center for Addictions and Mental Health, says this, depression is much more than simple unhappiness. Clinical depression, sometimes called major depression, is a complex mood disorder caused by various factors, including genetic predisposition, personality, stress, and brain chemistry. While it can suddenly go into remission, depression is not something that people can get over by their own effort. So certainly when we're depressed, in the very least, we need each other. We need each other's help on this journey. 
We're not going to find the words mental health or depression in the Bible, but that's because they didn't have that kind of psychological terminology. We're familiar with the terms depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, things like that, but instead of using those terms, the Bible talks about those things just in different ways. Jonah says, it would be better for me to be dead than to face what I'm facing. Elijah says, take my life, Lord. I am not better than my ancestors. He's saying, I'm useless, not getting anywhere. Pretty sure when they said these things, they were both experiencing some post-traumatic stress and were feeling quite depressed. Many examples of that in the scriptures. People we could diagnose with depression, biblical characters from Jonah to Job, Elijah, Jeremiah, King David, King Saul. All these people had stress-filled lives and could easily slip into depression. And Tuesday night in Bible study, we were looking at King Saul. He's a clear example of someone suffering from mental health issues. Here's a few verses from 1 Samuel 16. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, see an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. Whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul, he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. So he's been diagnosed with an evil spirit from God, which doesn't necessarily mean a demonic thing. It more likely refers to his ill temper or some sort of psychological affliction. This evil spirit affects Saul's brain, makes him feel terribly sad. That's common for people experiencing this kind of mental health issue. And David's music helps him. Today's music therapist would give David full marks for what he does here. One might think that Saul had no reason to be depressed. It doesn't take a reason. Saul was the king. He comes from a good family. He's tall and handsome. He's got it all. And he was chosen by God to do God's work. And he's a good example of how depression and mental health issues can derail a very successful person's life. Saul's life and his long reign as the king, it wasn't all bad. He had many good traits. He had many good years as a leader. But when Saul strayed from God's call, this evil begins to haunt him. And uh, we see in 1 Samuel, he, he continuously is deteriorating as this evil spirit uh, disrupts his sanity and his life. In 1 Samuel 18, the problem has gotten worse and worse. He's spiraling out of control to the point where he's so jealous of David and his mental state is so off kilter, he actually tries to kill David. And that behavior doesn't show any signs of stopping. He continues to pursue David and forcing David to go on the run and live as an outlaw, hiding all the time. And the saddest thing about it is Saul loves David. He loves David, but he's out of control. He has mental health issues. It's a sad, sad situation. And eventually he's so engulfed by his mental health issues that there's no hope for his recovery. It's a hopeless, sad story. If he was alive today, Saul could uh, get a diagnosis for his mental health and treatment could be recommended and uh, he'd have every hope for a productive, useful life with proper care and counseling and medication. Saul would have found his way back to God's will for his life. The good news is that God's grace is stronger than depression or mental health issues. We know Saul's story. He was overtaken by his struggle and in the end he killed himself during a battle when his army was losing. Now if that was the end of the Bible, <laughs> we'd all be depressed. But it's not. That's not the end of the story and Jesus enters the story and he is our cornerstone. 
He is our hope. There's a song we sing that says, I can rest in his unchanging grace. I can depend on that. We believe in a God who heals. In Matthew chapter 8, it says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. So here we are this morning, a room full of people who are called to serve the hurting souls in this world. But we can't guess what each other is going through here today. They say that 25% of women and 15% of men in Canada will suffer from serious depression. And that one in five Canadians will suffer some sort of mental health issues. But if we really believe that God's grace is sufficient, even in this, then in the very least we can be praying for each other. Be praying for these situations as we become aware of them. Because we know there is healing in the atonement. There's healing in the cross. Now we also know that our prayers for healing are not always answered. Not immediately, anyway. But we know that when prayers for healing are not answered, we still have the hope of our perfectly healthy resurrection body to look forward to. And along the way, we've prayed for people and we've lost people and we miss them. But we wouldn't wish them back here, would we? If we really believe what we say about life in heaven being infinitely superior to what we're experiencing here, then it would be wrong to wish for people to come back. I think if someone's with the Lord, we can be sure that's exactly where they want to be. But sometimes we lose loved ones because prayers for healing aren't always answered in the way we would like them. To be, but when prayers for healing are not answered, we have our perfectly healthy resurrection body to look forward to. So it's a win-win situation. And so we keep moving forward, keep going, keep putting one foot in front of the other as the people of God's kingdom move through this community and through this world, advancing the gospel as God calls us to. A guy named David Gascoigne, he wrote this, always wherever, whatever, however, when I am able to resist for once the constant pressure of failure to exist. Let me remember that truly to be man is to be man aware of thee and unafraid to be. So help me God. <laughs> unafraid to be, unafraid to live, unafraid to be the people of God to face all that life throws at us, the good and the bad. And along the way, to help our brothers and sisters in these moments when they end up like our hero, Samson. Successful in ministry, maybe, but curled up in a fetal position, crying out to God and saying, why is it like this? Why do I feel like this? Why does it hurt so much? Judges 15, 19, when Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. Samson's mission began in fine style with excellent results. And he ends up hiding in a cave, wondering what his future is going to look like. And then he comes out of the cave and he does even more spectacular ministry with even more spectacular results. And he ends up crying out to the Lord, I am dried up. I'm finished. I have no hope. I'm useless. I'm trying to help these people. I can't even help myself. He's at the end of his rope. He's accomplished great things for God, but he's now mystified by his current predicament. And so he prays. And God answered Samson's prayer, and Samson survived this and continued his life's mission for many years. Samson revived because he was willing to drink what God offered. If we think we know everything, if we think we already have all the answers, then our hearts cry like Samson's hearts cry. Our hearts cry may not be answered, may not be heard. If we don't learn dependence on God like Samson learned that day. If like Samson, we're willing to accept what's on offer from God, there's hope for us. The Lord offers us his grace. Grace 
to pay our spiritual debts and to set us free to serve him in the strength we receive from his Holy Spirit at work in the lives of those who love him, his people. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So let's be determined to drink in all that God has on offer for us today by way of the cross, by way of the outpouring of his spirit into our lives. And let us pray for each other that this reviving ministry of the spirit might lift us all up to a new level of Christian faith and Christian life and Christian ministry. We have so many prayer concerns for our congregation. I thought it might be helpful today if we sang that song, Somebody Prayed For Me. It describes this down in the dumps experience. When my heart was so broken that I could not pray. When love wasn't easy to see, someone was there. Somebody cared, somebody prayed for me. When the future looked hopeless, like Samson, and I'd given up, like Samson, when I had lost sight of my dreams, like Samson, somebody prayed for me. Let's be in prayer for each other as we sing.